Hi there, my name is Richie search and I'm a sociologist pursuing a PhD in social and cultural analysis at Concordia University, Montreal. Uh, this is a recorded version of a talk I gave at the Canadian um, Game Studies Association, or CGSA at Concordia University, this year um, on June the 18th, on challenging media produced nostalgia in hikikomori life. So here was my presentation your screen and there. In 1998, Japanese psychologist Saito Tamaki published a book describing young to middle age adults, mostly men, who spend months, years, or decades confined at home. Hikikomori was apt to describe these individuals as it translates to pulling inward and being confined. But this is also the same word used to describe the person suffering the withdrawal. There is no depressed person battling depression. There is only hikikomori understood by hikikomori. To make things more complicated, this is no longer specific to Japan. Since Saito Tomaki's account, international cases have emerged and a surge of withdrawn people after COVID-19 complicate who and what meets the condition. Some researchers have pitched the idea that hikikomori is better understood as a modern day depression to retreat from demands of everyday life. One other reaction to the demands of modern life is nostalgia, which is a yearning for a previous time, perhaps when things were simpler, good and old or great again. If hikikomori is to pull inward, nostalgia is the pain of wanting to return home. But for the withdrawn who are already at home, where should they go? The withdrawal may have been a personal choice at first, but it is my argument that I believe some remain isolated because a social choice has been made for them to stay this way. In sociology, we dislike things not because they are inherently bad, they are deemed as bad because we don't like them. The social judgment precedes the actual moral quality of the object that is being judged. For Hikikimori, who have lived years or decades in their rooms, screens, consoles, and phones allow for them to peek to the outside world, creating a literal and symbolic light that Gina Harazzi calls a virtual sunshine. Yet, this is eclipsed by scholarship, which argues that more connective devices is proof of more disconnectedness of the self. Psychologist Serge Tisseron argues that the individual is engulfed by the hikikomori condition. Everything they do, own, or say is like moving in quicksand. They may have pulled inward at first, but they are now pushed down by othering labels such as outcasts, neat, losers, things that many of us as players have heard and know too well. What's behind these sentiments is collective nostalgia, I argue. It is how the judgment travels beyond close-knit circles and broadcast it onto national media, memes, films, school books, music, advertisement, and so on. Collective nostalgia is what we use to judge the people in their rooms to grow up based on a life we have lived up to now from the past. To leave your room and get the things we currently have around us and may later cherish or the present. Or to get to life based on a projection of a life we'll hope to have lived in the future. Our personal and cultural nostalgia influence how we judge what others are and should be doing. For Svetlana Boim, nostalgia is about the past, but is always found in the presence. Hence, it is political, it sells, it is controversial, and for us it is an active search, a yearning for familiarity, for home. Thus, Boehm writes that we are nostalgic for the past, not for the way it was, but for the way it could have been. The bow of nostalgia's arrow is shaped by the past, but its target is always ahead.
It is imposed onto people, things, and beliefs in the present into ways that, quote, it could have been, unquote. Collective nostalgia is also what Boehm called restorative nostalgia, which would have been the nostalgic Japanese man restoring productivity to Japanese society, restoring honor to the family, and restoring values like living collectively, not solitarily. Since Ikikomori do not fit this nostalgic mold, they are punished by Japanese parents, media, and politicians who engaged in what Saito Tamaki calls, quote, structural ignorance, unquote. This ignorance, unfortunately, is seen with recent research from Europe in 2018 and Canada in 2016, which ignores the individual by looking at media devices and video games as sign of addiction and withdrawal confirmation. There is a fine line in setting out to study socially withdrawn people because of video games or to study socially withdrawing people who also happen to play video games. The shift of agency is important here. What, will, what was once Saito's system of structural ignorance is now a system that Berman and Rizzo in 2019 called uncontested hegemony which they find in the restorative nostalgia of media and psychological narratives. In such media, kikikomori are tied to a predefined past and future, which is also a feature of Boehm's restorative nostalgia. For simplicity's sake, I'll call the past previous, as the set of symptoms that psychologists have judged to be a mental disorder. Perpetuated here, by the anime and manga Welcome to the NHK, whilst the past future is the continued and expected stigma of hikikomori who are portrayed as crazy, violent media addicts to be a group that Berman and Rizzo say are, quote, both at risk and a risk to others, unquote. Just like in the photo Alice in Borderland, which is also a manga and anime. In other words, they're chained to people's nostalgia about their own lives, which is then fueled by media-produced nostalgia that dictates what it means to live life successfully. And so it is here as a sociologist where I ask, is there a way where video games, an inherently nostalgic medium that brings people and pasts together, capable of turning a system of structural ignorance into a system of structural empathy. Therefore, I went into the belly of the beast. If video games are indeed the things that make Hikikomori what they are, then let's have a look at what they have to offer. On the Steam Store page, I search up the keyword Hikikomori, and four titles emerged. The first three followed the restorative nostalgia that they were unattractive, violent, and surreal people. It is important to note that the game in the middle, Pool Stay, is made by a person who is recovering from Hikikomori themselves. But for today's analysis, I'm focusing on the fourth one. Hik Hikikomori Life by Micro Team Games, an indie title, which Jesper Yule in 2015 finds have a counterfactual nostalgia or a yearning for a false past that players feel they experienced but never have. It's the same feeling you get by playing a low-budget game with blocky 8-beat art and Yankee controls because it smells of Minecraft, Doom, or Shovel Knight. In the case of Hikikomori, which is not widely known outside Asia, this counterfactual nostalgia may help attract Western players because the comfort of returning to a, quote, memory home might help them to adjust to be pulled inward into the house of a Hikikomori. And so, when I began Hikimori Life, I was tasked to, quote, satisfy game addiction and not to perish from human needs, unquote, by fulfilling a total of eight reminiscent of the game The Sims. Nostalgic players may remember that The Sims offered you more choice in how, what, where, and whom you'd want to live with based on the income you have from working Needs are important, and neglecting them will lead to a lower mood or even death. In Ikikomori life, 
a nostalgic distortion occurs. The more money the Hikon, or the player, accumulates by working at the computer, the fewer choices they have to live the life they want. Money in this game can only be used to do two things. One, hire a maid or buy a robot vacuum, which fulfills the purity need. Or two, upgrading the computer system, which increases the game addict need faster. The player and the Hikon cannot command themselves to call a psychologist with the money they've achieved, nor can they interact with the cleaning companion, nor can they purchase furniture to express themselves. They are both trapped in the past, previous, and past future. That is the game of life as a hikikomori. With Yule's counterfactual nostalgia, indie game builds on play expectations that we have cultivated from nostalgia of previous titles. Robin Sloan in 2016 calls this method putting games on games, and it is at the point of disjuncture when the present game breaks the nostalgic illusion it was riding on. This, quote, shattering of nostalgic selectiveness, unquote, writes Sloan, sobers the player back into the gritty reality, instead of providing a rose-tinted vision of the past that is augmented and improved for contemporary tastes, unquote. Players using the nostalgia of games where money equates to progress will be disappointed as money furthers addiction. Likewise, all needs cannot be tended to when the game addict bar in Hikikomori life is below 25%. Despite other needs reaching below zero, I have to play games. Game addiction takes priority. And so on my first playthrough, I chose to play in a way that maximized the Hikan's needs. Punctually feeding, bathing, cleaning, sleeping, pooing, and making money. The game addict meter was kept up, but never full. It was my goal to help the Hikan live in a way that resisted the restorative nostalgia that they have to fulfill the game addict. I didn't want them to be game addicts. I wanted to know what was on the other side of Harazzi's virtual sunshine. Basically, what is their personal nostalgia? or what Boehm's call reflective nostalgia. Their character story, their desire, or even just a memory. Alas, all I got from interacting with their belongings was the static hum of the game and the stasis of concrete pixels. The only time these items did anything was when they acted as, quote, distractions, unquote, or quick time events to solve with just a click. The neighbors are too loud, someone's knocking at the door, or the city is too bright outside. Just like the word hikikomori, the items reveal only the history of how the condition is portrayed, rather than the biography of how it is felt. Perhaps the hardest part about my playthrough was not managing the distractions, but managing my own frustration that I felt from being unable to progress or live in this, this game. Even in a game like Minecraft, where the narrative is a little free flow, players can progress and tell their own stories by incorporating the restorative nostalgia they have of a utopia, or their reflective or personal nostalgia of a childhood home they grew up in. They do this by building and modifying the game. Hikikomori life does not allow for such modifications. And so this nostalgia that players are inclined to actualize is a distant but teetering memory. It was this realization that gave birth to another. I was not actually trying to reveal the reflective nostalgia of the Hikan. I was trying to impose my own reflective nostalgia of how I play games and how I lived a life. Here, I experienced a shattering of nostalgic selectiveness per Sloan, because my restorative nostalgia of progression in games like The Sims or reflective nostalgia of a life lived well does nothing here. Memories cannot be made in a game that doesn't want to save anything or anyone. 
The Hekan never achieves that life we were told to get. They never grew up to become what we are. Nor did they leave the room to find whatever it was we all are still searching for. If I played along with the restorative nostalgia that these are game addicts, well, the game ends with a congratulatory note saying thanks for trying the demo. And you can now try and kill the Hikan again <laughs> with a smiley face. On the other hand, if I try to uncover the reflective or personal nostalgia of the Hikan, I would find myself in a shattered nostalgic frustration that I, quote, could have been, unquote, playing a game that allowed for progress and choice, or that I, quote, could have been, unquote, helping the Hikikomori out of their withdrawal, if only the game was as good and old like The Sims. Peter Mackay, in 2018, argues that this unique affective disjuncture is what video games can give us, and what he calls reparatory nostalgia. Reparatory nostalgia warns us that some things cannot be changed or repaired even by turning back the clock. In simpler words, even after one million restarts of Hikikomori life, both myself and the Hikan will still be dependent on the game addict meter to play or even finish the game. None of us escapes the game addict withdrawal. And so... What does this mean to game scholars, designers, writers, and players in the room? When we design or create something remarkable, we are always forgetting something or someone else. It's natural. The trade-off allows us to give players, quote, the past not for the way it was, but for the way it could have been, unquote, per boy. There is always a layer of nostalgia from the developers or the culture it represents that seeps into the vehicle that we use to drive back to a past play experience or a future through speculative play that we call a video game. Perhaps video games might be able to educate the public about hikikomori. Beyond family therapy, scholars are now demanding a quote, more proactive approach, unquote, per Wong and Lee in 2021. And in 2017, Kato et al. found that Pokemon Go's leaderboards, local gyms, and trainers, or other players, kept a hikikomori person socially active without having to face the pressures of a live social encounter. Happily, they reported that this helped the individual move out of withdrawal, because the rewarding nature of Pokemon Go and games like this or a, quote, potential first step towards more permanent solutions, unquote. But in this case, the takeaway is that Pokemon Go or video game trophies save the day. But why did the player play? Was there a nostalgic connection they felt? What is their personal nostalgia? I am hopeful that video games will play a more positive role in how we have understood and come to understand Hikikomori. Today, my playthrough interpretation and notes may have been the doings of a bored sociologist, but imagine a room of the people responsible for Saito Tamaki's structural ignorance, policymakers, parents, and members of the public who came to play Hikikomori life and have their reflective and restorative nostalgias shattered. What kinds of, quote, real communication, unquote, per Saito would occur? Can the sobering fact of how many Hikans are killed because of a politician or a parent's nostalgic desire to impose their life worth living the way they lived it, turn this structure of ignorance into a structure of empathy, perhaps? Hmm. To conclude, there is what I call nostalgic potential in video games like Hikikomori because it reveals the nostalgia that we all use and consume to play with the image of the Hikikomori as another to the self as the not-stalgia to our nostalgia. 
But design choices, such as putting games on games to lure new but receptive audiences, may be impactful if their nostalgia is shattered and guided into a place of perhaps structural empathy. After all, the withdrawal goes both ways. They have pulled away from living outside Hikikomori, and we ourselves are holding off from escaping into rooms such as theirs. But both us and Hikikomori have still and will always continue to play the same game that never ends. The grueling, nostalgic-inducing life itself. Even in the world of the virtual sunshine, the game never ends. Uh, and so that was my presentation. Uh, that's how you say my name, Sirachini Korn. Uh, for references and questions, please feel free to email me. I'd like to thank again um, the CGSA uh, panel and, and uh, moderators and the executive for allowing this opportunity, um, as well as Concordia University and the Technoculture Arts and Games Research Center, as well as uh, the Missouri Institute for hosting uh, the event this year. Thank you very much.